वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर अपर्णा वाटवे फैकल्टी ऑफ टाटा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ सोशल साइंसेस दिस मॉड्यूल इज अबाउट इंडियन एनवायरमेंटल एक्ट्स एंड पॉलिसीज इट इज पार्ट ऑफ पेपर एनवायरमेंट एंड सोसाइटी इन दिस मॉड्यूल वी विल टॉक अबाउट सम ऑफ द की एक्ट्स दैट हेल्प अस टू प्रोटेक्ट इंडियन एनवायरमेंट द एयर पोल्यूशन कंट्रोल एक्ट the water pollution control act are the first two acts i will also discuss the umbrella act the environmental protection act and some of its provisions earth is a unique planet it is the only one among millions of other planets in the world which can actually hold life life evolved on earth after billions of years the combination of air water soil makes it possible for the life to exist all the living and non living components around us are the environment their processes maintain our life protecting environment is equal to protecting life on earth protecting and improving environment is a constitutional mandate in india india is a welfare state it has committed to protection of environment and the protection of its citizens through this indian constitution contains specific provisions for environmental protection they are under the chapters of directive principles of state policy and fundamental duties in june 1972 united nations held a conference on human environment at stockholm it agreed to take appropriate steps for the preservation of natural resources in india this includes the preservation of quality of air water and stopping their pollution various acts in india address the issue of quality of environment one of the important acts is the water prevention and control of pollution act of 1974 water is an integral part of our life water is a colorless odorless transparent liquid these qualities of water are lost when water gets polluted polluted water is unfit for us it cannot be used for any purpose water is an essential element for human life but it can be used only when it is clean contamination of water is injurious to health of humans animals and mainly for the aquatic life the water prevention and control of pollution act aims to prevent and control water pollution it helps to maintain and restore wholesomeness of water central and state pollution control boards have been established to monitor and enforce this act this act was made in 1974 it was mainly to prevent pollution caused by industrial agricultural and household sources of waste water it includes provisions to assess pollution levels and punish the polluter it includes provisions to assess pollution levels and punish the polluter it works on the principle polluters must pay when waste water enters aquatic habitats it causes health hazards industry releasing its waste in water is a major cause of pollution many industries like paper industry chemical and fertilizer industry release their effluents in water systems these are called point sources of pollution one way to prevent pollution of water is to control these point sources point sources can be monitored to make sure that the waste coming out is within the permissible limits otherwise the industry can be punished many times responsible citizens can keep a watch on the pollution and inform the relevant authority if they notice that water is getting polluted polluting sources have been identified where petroleum products and heavy metals are used extensively there are also many non point sources of waste a single point cannot be located for pollution which is caused by these free disposal of solid and liquid waste overuse of chemicals in farming are the non point sources of pollutions 
the toxins in these systems ultimately reach water bodies and pollute it individuals can do several things to reduce water pollution we can use biodegradable chemicals even for household use use of pesticides and weedicides in the gardens and farms can be reduced water gets polluted even when too much of organic waste is thrown in water this waste decomposes and then pollutes water biomedical waste from hospitals is one of the most dangerous waste it has to be treated in special plants citizens can help prevent water pollution by developing watchdog groups they can monitor environment and inform authorities to take appropriate action against different types of pollution sources many such groups are already present in india polluters must pay for their action but preventing pollution is a better solution than punishing the offenders after they have polluted water bodies pollution control boards are set up by the central government as well as the state government they have all the necessary powers to deal with the problems of pollution the penalties for violation of acts are already fixed central and state water testing laboratories have been set up to enable the pollution control boards to assess the pollution standards have been laid down to establish guilt and fines on the polluters central board advises the central government on any matters concerning the prevention and control of pollution it coordinates activities with the state boards and resolves any conflicts it also provides technical assistance and guidelines it can establish research to understand how pollution can be prevented the board also organizes many awareness programs and creates awareness through mass media it is also mandatory for the board to continuously publish data regarding water pollution and air pollution central and state boards together create rules to ensure proper disposal of waste air is also source of our life any change in air quality has direct harmful effect on all life air pollutants are solid liquid or gaseous substances present in the atmosphere in such concentrations as to be injurious to human beings or other creatures Indian government passed the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act in 1981. It was to help keep our air clean. The objective is to prevent and control the air pollution. Sources of air pollution are industry, vehicles, different types of power plants. They are not permitted to release the air pollutants beyond a certain prescribed level. following is a list of common air pollutants particulate matter lead carbon monoxide carbon dioxide nitrogen oxide and many other volatile organic components are substances listed as toxic to life their concentration in the air is fixed by a certain limit these are defined by law any activity that raises their level in air has to be stopped immediately pollution control boards continuously measure the level of atmospheric pollutants these are measured as parts per million or in milligrams or micrograms per cubic meter particulate matter and gases are released by industry cars buses and two wheelers they are measured by using air sampling equipment air pollution is most acute in heavily industrialized and urbanized areas again it is the duty of us as citizens to appreciate the dangers of air pollution reducing our own pollution is necessary many of us do not even test our vehicles for pollution how many of you have valid pollution free certificate for your vehicle If you are living in a city or even visiting it you will immediately notice that the air is extremely polluted 
the law may not ever find and punish us, but we are collectively paying the price for neglecting the law. This price is paid in the form of our rising medical bills. The air and water pollution control laws were very helpful. In the late 1980s, Department of Environment was established. Later, in 1985, this became known as the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Today, it is known as the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. The intentions of the government were very noble. But there was a very serious gap in the pollution acts that were present till then. These gaps were revealed by one of the greatest tragedies, a man-made disaster in India. This was the Bhopal gas tragedy. In the 1970s, Union Carbide Corporation built a plant in Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. This plant was producing a pesticide known as Sevin. The manufacturing process required hazardous material to be stored in company. In 1984, the company decided to close the plant. But the plant continued to operate. It operated without the necessary safety equipments and procedures. They were far below the standards. On 2nd December 1984, one operator at the plant noticed a small leak of methyl isocyanate or MIC gas. This gas is highly toxic. The leak was noticed around 11 at night. The operator noticed increased pressure inside a storage tank. At about 1 o'clock, a safety valve misfunctioned. Nothing could be done. It sent out a large cloud of methyl isocyanate gas into the air. It had disastrous effects, something which had never been seen before in the world. Within a few hours, streets of Bhopal were littered with human bodies. Countless buffaloes, cows, dogs, birds all scattered and died on the street. It is estimated that 3,800 people died immediately. These people were mostly from the poor slum colony which was adjacent to the plant. Medical facilities in the city could not cope up with this kind of disaster. Official estimates tell us that half a million people were exposed to toxic gas that one single night. In the next few years, thousands of people died prematurely. They suffered various diseases due to exposure to toxic gas. Babies were born with mental and physical disabilities. Bhopal gas disasters is one of the worst chemical disasters in the history of the world. The plant continued to leak toxic chemicals that finally entered water. The company was not from India. It attempted to evade all responsibility for the damage. Most victims did not get adequate compensation. Even 30 years after the gas leak, many victims have been neglected. The laws and policies of that time were virtually ineffective to do anything about this. They could not bring any justice to the victims. The government was held widely responsible for failure to have effective laws. It was held responsible that it could not prevent the disaster or prosecute the polluters. Following this disaster, in 1986, a new Environment Protection Act was formulated. This was a result of environmental awareness and activism in India which followed the big tragedy. This act is an umbrella legislation. It fills many gaps in the earlier laws. It looks at environment as a whole. The objective of this act is to provide protection and improve environment. Article 48A of this act clearly states that the state shall protect and improve environment. 
it will also safeguard forest and wildlife of india according to the section 51a of the environment protection act every citizen shall protect environment this act is applicable to whole of india including jammu and kashmir under this act ministry of environment and forest has all the responsibility for administering and enforcing the environment laws and policies in india it established the importance of integrating environmental strategies into all industrial development but it has not been very effective in many cases economy is given priority development happens at the cost of environment the environment protection act is still an important legislation it provides for coordination of activities of various regulatory agencies it has authority and has adequate powers for environmental protection and regulation of discharge of pollutants there are specific rules for handling of hazardous substances the act also has provisions to extend legal protection to non forest habitats ecologically sensitive areas can be declared in grasslands wetlands and coastal zone ecosystems let us now understand some of the important terms used in this act environment includes water air land and their interrelationships with human beings and other living creatures if any one of them is harmed they can be prosecuted under the law environmental pollutant is any solid liquid or gaseous substance present in such concentrations as are injurious to environment and humans hazardous substance is any substance that is liable to cause harm to human beings or other living creatures environmental pollution means imbalance in environment the act gives powers to central government to make rules to regulate environmental pollution it can notify standards and maximum limits of pollutants in air water and soil for various areas and various purposes the central government also has specific hazardous waste management and handling rules and separate rules for biomedical waste this ensures that hazardous waste is properly disposed of without adverse effect on the environment national green tribunal is a special court that deals exclusively with environmental issues environment impact assessment is a very special procedure in 1994 the ministry issued environment impact assessment notification by this notification environmental clearance was made necessary for expansion or modernization of any project which could be hazardous in 2006 moef notified new environment impact assessment legislation it makes it mandatory for various large scale projects to get environmental clearance these projects include mining thermal power plants river valley projects and infrastructural projects like roads highways ports and airports it is mainly the responsibility of the state government to give the clearance environmental impact assessment or eia can be defined as the study to predict the effect of a proposed activity or project on the environment it is a decision making tool eia compares various alternatives for the project and finds out economic and environmental costs and benefits eia examines beneficial and adverse consequences of the project it gives suggestions for project design it helps to identify measures that will mitigate the negative impacts of the project a properly conducted eia reduces conflicts with the local communities 
EIA requires a list of flora and fauna of the region where the project is going to be created. If there is any endangered species in the region, suggestions need to be made for the protection of the species. Impacts of different industries are very different. Some sites are located in ecologically highly sensitive areas or they are near unique ecosystems. All these aspects are taken into consideration during the EIA process. This is before the project development actually starts. New projects are called greenfield projects. There is no development on these sites before the project. There are some projects which already exist but require expansion. They must also acquire clearance. These are called as brownfield projects. Projects can be classified based on their impacts. Those with mild impacts, moderate impacts and serious impacts have different EIA procedures. Some projects may have temporary major impacts, mainly during the construction phase. It could later become less damaging or can be mitigated by simple measures. Some projects could have long-term impacts. There needs to be a continuous monitoring of these impacts throughout the project period. Some projects have reversible damage, others have irreversible damage. To get an environment clearance, the project proposal has to be given by the company to the State Pollution Control Board. The State Pollution Control Board checks and confirms what kind of EIA has to be initiated. Agency which does the EIA assessment submits the report to the company. This may take several months. The report of the environment statement is forwarded to the central ministry. Details of EIA procedures can be found in the e-text that is uploaded with this module. After 1997, Ministry of Environment and Forests made it compulsory to have a public hearing of the EIA report at local level. The Pollution Control Board must put an advertisement about the public hearing in local vernacular language newspapers. An environmental impact assessment study has executive summary. This summary is made available for people to read at the time of public hearing. The venue and time of public hearing is widely known. Local people can attend the public hearing and voice any displeasure with the project. Their arguments have to be heard and video recorded. Some of these could also be against the project. Minutes of this meeting are regularly documented and sent to the Ministry of Environment and Forest. Even if the process is clear and transparent, there are many loopholes. Very often, it has been seen that the voices of the people affected by the project are not heard. NGOs often have to take up the cause of the people and ensure that EI proceeds in a fair manner. Experience has shown that large number of EIs are not researched adequately. Sometimes they are biased because they are funded by the very company which is going to have the project. Most EIs concentrate on studies of water, air and soil pollution. But they cannot deal effectively with issues of biodiversity and other environmental factors. They have lacunae in social impact assessments. Biodiversity concerns are frequently neglected. They only consist a listing of species in the region, but they cannot judge what will be the impact of the project on the animals and plants of the area. Changes in land use pattern also affect the communities which are living around the project area. These changes are rarely taken into account. Such issues are very difficult to assess. The issue of equity of resource distribution is also not addressed by the present EIA. It is not sufficient to say that EIA has been done. Its quality and sincerity are of prime importance. 
AI is not meant to stop development. It is only to ensure that the industry does not damage fragile environment. Once the impacts are identified, the project proponent can decide how to mitigate them. Sometimes it is as simple as planting a green belt of trees around the project area. In other cases, when the damage is too much, something like creating a protected area nearby can also be tried. Wildlife management plans are part of EIS. They are made to ensure protection and management of wildlife after the project starts functioning. Rehabilitation and resettlement of project affected people is done under a very separate law. Indian laws are praised for their comprehensive treatment and tools created to ensure environmental protection. But the implementation has encountered many problems. This is mainly due to conflicting interests of development and environment protection. It is a duty of all of us as responsible citizens to know about environment laws and to ensure that they are followed. In this module, we tried to get information about various environmental acts of India. Information about this act can be also found in the e-text module. All of these acts are available on the website of Ministry of Environment and Forest. You can look at the links given in the essential reading section. I hope you have realized how important it is to protect the environment. Thank you for being with us. Hope to see you soon.